Well, hey there, church. I want to welcome all you hearty Midwesterners making it out in the midst of stormy weather. And I want to welcome our Bendor family joining in as well with our Kwani men and each of you tuning in online. I love that we get to worship together as one church in multiple locations, that we get to connect deeply and meaningfully across miles through technology. And I celebrate that this is a new year. This is this is 2020, and this weekend is a vision weekend for us as a church. So it's vision weekend in the year 2020, which, my friends, is a treasure trove of metaphors, word plays, illustrations, and examples for preachers. It's a gold mine. <laughs> but I'm going to spare you. I'm not even going to do it. I'm not going to go there. But I am going to just let you know that I did have an eye exam recently. In fact, um, Someone who shall remain nameless, but who I have lived with for 27 years and initials are BC, <laughs> felt like I needed to have an eye exam. And so I went, and I'm happy to say I was given 2020, 2020 vision was the diagnosis for me. And I went home and told that person who shall re remain nameless, and they indicated that they felt that I probably had to work hard to get that and maybe strained a little bit to get there. And even though I did, it's still a win in my mind. A win <laughs> is a win. Perhaps the wrong win altogether, but a win nonetheless. 2020 vision on a vision weekend in 2020, people, that's kind of cool to me. <laughs> now, one of the things I love that's going on in our church is that a number of new individuals and families have been leaning into our journey together. And I think it's helpful to once in a while just stop and review a bit of our journey and why we do what we do, and especially so with new families leaning in. And if you're one of those new families, I'm so glad you're part of this journey and leaning in with us. But as we have a conversation this weekend that really kind of looks at our why behind our what, it's not just a conversation for those just leaning in, it's a conversation for all of us. It's good to be reminded, it's good to remember, it's good to recognize and realize why we do what we do as a church. See, we hold a fundamental understanding that we exist to connect people to God, to each other, and to their purpose. We know that we exist for this. We, we see this as a privilege. We see it as a commitment that we hold to. We also see it as, as a design, God's design. And, and this weekend is designed as a vision weekend 2020. But again, not going to go there with those metaphors because this is really not a typical vision message. I am not going to spend time talking so much about what we do, but I really want to talk about why we do it. I don't want to just lean into understanding what we do. I, I want to lean into understanding why we do what we do, why we partner, why we seek to collaborate, why we are willing to invest in hard spaces, why we seek the peace and prosperity of our cities, why we talk about flourishing and thriving. I mean, it, it all comes back to Jesus. But this weekend is an opportunity to understand why we do what we do. And, and in the midst of a world that has lots of brokenness, a world that, that has wars and rumors of wars, uh, crisis and conflict, sadness and sorrow, in the midst of all of that, but see, here's the thing, Jesus offers more. He, he offers a way out. He offers a path forward, even in those dynamics. And it comes in connecting to God, to others, and to our greater purpose. We get to do that. We're looking at the why behind our what in our conversation today, and I'm excited for you to lean in with me in that conversation. You know, one of the things I hear around this time of year is like, new year, new you. You ever heard that? Like, new year, new you? It sounds cool and even inspiring, but I would encourage you not to seek a new you this year, but to understand the real you. How you were created, who you were created to be, who you're intended to be, and who you're called to be. The real you. Because that's the space that you experience hope. That's the space you experience flourishing and life and, and freedom. And all of that comes out of relationship with Jesus. That's where that's found, the, the real you. In fact, as we start this conversation, I think it's helpful to understand a principle, and it's the first fill-in if you want to use your note guide today, that living a filled life, a, a filled life, is not the same as living a full one. Living a filled life is not the same as living a full one. That's a very simple concept, but an essential one. And you already know and understand the principle, but let me just illustrate this in a, in a simple way. Um, we have probably all had potato chips. And, and when I, if I eat potato chips, I like salt and vinegar potato chips and kettle cooked in particular. Now, we have all, when we've held the bag of potato chips, 
recognize very quickly that it is filled, but it is not full. Amen? It is filled with air and has a very dissatisfying smattering of potato chips at the bottom. It is filled, but not full, all right? There's a difference between being filled and full. Even if you get an order of french fries, once you take those french fries and you tamp them down, you realize that thing was filled, not full. There's a difference between filled and full, and, and the reality is there's a difference between living a filled life and a full one. There's lots of things that we can fill our lives with. We have work, we have family, we have extracurricular things, we have school. Even as a church, we're engaged in a number of things. We have a broad footprint. We have a regional influence. There are many things that we can fill our lives with, but there's a difference between living a filled life and a full one. And Jesus actually calls us to live full lives, not just filled And to understand the difference and to make sure we're leaning towards fullness and not just filled, we have to look at not just what we do, but why and how we do it. There's a difference between living a filled life and a full life. In fact, Jesus himself declared in a bit of a purpose statement for him something in John chapter 10, verse 10. Here's what he said. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the what? to the full. There's a difference between being filled and being full. Jesus is declaring a bit of a purpose statement. He's declaring his why in coming. And he's revealing in that statement the fundamental connection to his father and connection to others, to us as well. And that purpose, that why is about a full life and not just a filled one. The word in scripture for full is actually parasos, and it means more, it means abundant, exceedingly more. It really means more than what is. Some commentaries specifically describe it as exceeding some number or measure, over and above, super added, exceedingly abundantly, supremely. So we could take Jesus' statement where he says life to the full and we could translate it more literally that we may have and enjoy life, abundant life, to the full till it overflows. That's awesome. I love it. But what does it actually mean? How do we connect into that? How do we experience not just a filled life, but a full life, a life full because of what Jesus gives us? See, as a church, we're intentional in talking about a number of things, but one of the things you hear us talk about is flourishing. You've heard me mention that even earlier in this conversation. And when we talk about flourishing, we're talking about this. We're talking about full life, a life found in Jesus. And that's the reason we as a church even invest in places like prisons and schools and neighborhoods, because we're committed to creating space out of a love for people, to a space that people can actually live into a full life and not just filled ones. To, to not have just filled experiences, but full experiences in Christ. It's why we invest differently as a church. And let me just clarify, when we invest in those unusual places, the, the hard spaces, the places out in our community, we're not pursuing a social gospel in that. We're pursuing a biblical gospel, a whole gospel. When we engage in issues of justice, we're not pursuing social justice. We're pursuing biblical justice, righteousness, wholeness, fullness, exceedingly abundantly more in a relationship to Jesus Christ. It's why we engage the way we do. It's why we, if you think, why don't we just focus on us? Why don't we just invest here and take care of us? Listen, it's, that's the reason. The whole gospel, the biblical gospel, biblical justice and righteousness is fullness and wholeness beyond just us. And if you want to process that a bit more, because I don't have time to get into a day, Matthew 25, the very last section of Matthew 25, from verse 31 to the end, Jesus is talking about a dynamic that explains why it's so important not just to focus in our dynamic, but to be able to invest beyond for more in other spaces. You can check that out at another time. But my hope is that we today will start to understand that a filled life is different than full. Filled robs us of joy. Uh, uh, Filled steals our dreams, destroys our dreams. And we can do that all by ourselves as humans, but there is this spiritual dynamic in life where there is the thief. There There is someone who seeks to kill, steal, and destroy in the spiritual dynamic, but Jesus, in, in direct counter-opposition to that, provides something very different. 
Jesus seeks to fill us to fullness if we're willing to let him, if we're willing to let go and leave behind and set aside the things that get in the way of being able to do that. And today, I want to look specifically at an example of Jesus doing that reality, living that out, and, and really framing, again, our why behind our what as a church. So before we get to that example, though, I want to frame the conversation just a little bit out of some things you may have heard and understood for us as a church before. It really gets back to that idea of connecting people to God, to each other, and to their purpose. And if you're someone who likes to draw when we have these conversations, there's a big block in the note guide you can use, and you can draw what I'm drawing in the middle, because I'm going to come back to it a couple times. You can add notes out on the side if you want to. But I have declared and said that we exist to connect people to God, to each other, and to their purpose. This is why we exist. Connecting to God, to other people, and to the greater purpose that we were created for, intended for, called to. This is, this is how we function as a church. And, and when we live this way, as we grow closer to God, we actually grow closer to each other. The same dynamic happens in marriage. When a husband and wife pursue God and seeking to know Him, they actually draw closer to God as they do that. But same thing happens in a community dynamic. And, and we have said repeatedly, we seek to live loved and linked and sent, so that shapes a bit of this. We have six values that frame and guide how we live this out, but this is what we do as a church and really called to do as individuals as well. But the key is that it's, it's us together. It's, it's me and you. It's, it's you and us. Uh, me and you and uh, me and yins, if you want to go that far. Like, it's together. But, but listen, it's not, we're not created for life alone out here, and we're not created for life enmeshed over here. We're created for life together with Jesus, pursuing the things of God. So we as a church collectively seek to do that. It's why we talk the way we talk. It's why we invest the way we invest. And when we understand this, it all begins to start to make a bit of sense. But I want to take this into an example in the life of Christ, because quite honestly, he's our everything. <laughs> he's why we do what we do. He's the example we follow. And I want to look at an example. So if you have a Bible with you, you can turn to John chapter 8. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to have the scriptures up on the screen, and Note Guide has them as well. In fact, if you don't have a Bible on the way out today, make sure you go by the Next Steps area and get one. We want to give you one. The, the Bible is essential to our journey. It's, it's the key for us living in fullness with Him because we get to know and understand what fullness looks like as we lean into this. So we're looking, though, at a section in scripture where Jesus kind of invites, maybe even redirects some folks towards full life. Um, maybe even away from the thing that was an obstacle to them experiencing full life. So let's take a look at this. We're in John chapter 8, and I'm going to start with verse 2. At dawn, he, and that's Jesus, uh, appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery, they, they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? Verse 6, they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. They were knuckleheads, honestly. That's added. I added that part. But then Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. I want to just hold there for just a moment. Because for, for some, the, this interaction may be familiar to you. It may not be familiar. For some, it may bother you. It may feel disturbing to some degree. Maybe not. But as you process the realities of this interaction, I want to encourage you to set aside how you've normally approached it, what you normally see in it, and simply see it as a, as a space of connecting people to God, to each other, and to their purpose. In order to do that, you may need to set aside a bit of the harsh extremes in the story. And I want to encourage you to do that, to set aside maybe the harsh extreme of the heaviness of the sin of adultery. Set aside the harsh extreme of the injustice for the woman being used as a pawn by these men. Set aside the male chauvinism of the day. Set aside the brutality of the punishment associated with that action. 
Set aside the harsh extremes for a moment and, and simply see this as a space of connecting people to God, to each other, and to their purpose. A, a space of an individual and a group interacting with God. I mean, really, we're talking about interacting with Jesus, and he himself was God. He was fully God, fully man. We're talking about a woman, and we're talking about a group of men. We're talking about a person and a people interacting with the Prince of Peace. And we're about to see that that Prince of Peace is willing and able to remove great obstacles through simple obedience. Whether they are obstacles we have created on our own or whether others have created them for us, he's able to do so when we step in that simple, bold obedience. And this dynamic we're reading is a prime example of leading people into flourishing. That's what Jesus was doing for both the men and the, and the woman. It was a space of leading them into flourishing. It was a space of connecting people to God, to each other, and to their purpose. So let's step back into the narrative for just a moment and continue to read. This is now going to be stepping into verse 9, but I want to frame first for a moment one feeling you still have in your note guide. That here it is, that doing what's right leads us to what's next. See, as we lean into this next part of the conversation, there's an opportunity for us to see that doing what's right always leads us to our next. And it connects into this dynamic and the interaction that we see with Jesus to this point. So let's jump back in, though. This is verse 9 of John chapter 8. At this, and this would be Jesus turning this ambush on its head for the good of everybody involved. All right? Flourishing and fullness for everybody involved, even those who may have been on the peripheral listening in to what was happening. But here we go. Those, those who heard... I heard what Jesus said, began to go away one at a time, the older ones first. Which ones first? The older. I wonder why. Was it, was it that they were wiser? Is it that they were more self-aware? Is it that they had more water under the bridge? I don't really know why, but I know they did. And I know that detail was included in Scripture, which I love that about the Word of God. There's a nuance to it. So the older ones start to leave first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Verse 11, no one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. You know, I, uh, I consider this to be one of the greatest expressions of loving interaction that Jesus had with humanity, both the men and the women. And it's not surprising. I mean, he himself is love. He does nothing apart from love. There isn't anything that we can do to drift outside of his love. It doesn't matter what we do. He still loves us. Yet, in this particular dynamic, one that was a trap, one that was marked by deception, one that had overt sin, he chooses to lead with love. He chooses to lead with grace. And that's our heart as a church. It's why we do what we do. It's why we invest in hard spaces. It's why we're willing to go into the places others may not want to go, but we go in the love and the name and the power of Jesus. This, this woman was caught in her sin, in her shame, in her brokenness. I don't know what led to her to make those decisions. I don't know what kind of pain preceded it. I don't know what kind of loss was there. I don't know if she experienced abuse before she started making the decision she made. But I'll tell you this, anytime someone repeatedly finds himself going back to a sin, there is always a storyline behind it. There's always something that Jesus wants to undo, heal, and fix to lead into flourishing. But in this case, she's in this sin, and therefore, she's, she's sinning against God, and she's sinning against others. At the same time, these men were sinning against her. Uh, they, there was an offense for her in, the, in how they're using her as a pawn. They were using her in, in her in their scheme, and there was a push even towards Jesus. They were trying to diminish Jesus, reject Jesus, so they didn't have to deal with the flourishing that he was calling them to. 
They had hypocrisy in what they were doing. They were selfish. They had a lack of grace. They were fighting for the wrong win. <laughs> Something way worse than a vision 2020. <laughs> It was, it was the wrong win. And yet Jesus offers something totally different. He offers a way out. He offers a way into flourishing for all of us because he created, intended, and called us with specific purpose. The, the why behind his journey directly plays into the why for us in our journey. And as a church, we're committed to leaning in and doing what Jesus did. In that moment, and what he even does in these moments. Spaces where people can move from being filled to being full. Living into their intended purpose. We step into places of brokenness. We step into spaces and we create space. We hold space for fullness to come. It's messy. It's complicated. But it's beautiful and powerful at the same time. And I love that the Lord lets us do it. You know, there's a lot in this narrative that I love. I love this exchange. There's so many things about it. And, but there's one particular moment that really intrigues me. Much of it fascinates me, but there's one thing that just captures my curiosity. And it's the whole dynamic of what Jesus was doing on the ground. What was he writing? What was he drawing? Like, we don't, we don't really know. But I, I wonder what that was because it played a direct role in communicating a message or creating a space that allowed flourishing to come. But like, was, was he writing out specific sins that applied to the men in the group? Was he writing the names of the men in the group? Was he writing truth, like sections of scripture that would remind these men of what they forgot that allowed them to get to the place that they were? What, what was, he, what was he doing on the ground in that space? We, we don't know, yet I think it could be helpful for us to even consider the possibilities of what it was. Because if he's writing out sins, for us, we could go, man, I, maybe that sin, apply, that's, that sin applies to me. Because in a dynamic for these guys, they were doing this comparison thing. Like, well, okay, I have sins, but this sin is way worse. Her sin's way worse. And I'm going to tell you something. Comparison is not a path to flourishing. It never is. In our, our ability to flourish, our ability to know and understand our identity is not found in comparison. It's found in comparison to Jesus. Yeah, okay, but we're supposed to be like him, but not in comparison to other pe people. There, there's no path to flourishing and fullness in comparison. And, and these guys were doing a bit of that thing where we have these respectable sins. Well, these are, these are like small sins, respectable sins, and that's a bad sin. And Jesus is saying, look, sin, sin. Sin, sin. Whoever's without sin, throw the first stone. Was he writing the sins? Or maybe even if he was writing names. Man, if he's writing names, and I go, man, I, I, my name gets tagged. I, I, I have sin. You have sin. Like, I have sin to own. I need grace. I need, I need God's mercy. And if he's just writing truth, well, we also need that as well. Because there is truth, there is way, there is life, but that's only in Jesus. Jesus gives us the path to flourishing, a space where we can experience fullness. And again, whatever it was that he wrote on the ground, those men had the vision, <laughs> literal vision, to be able to see it, recognize it, and they dropped everything. Literally and figuratively, they dropped their accusation, they dropped the trap, they even dropped their stones. They dropped it. Doing the right thing always leads us to our next thing. Our next right thing. You know, I don't know where you're at in your journey. I don't know what you know of God or Jesus at this point, but I'll tell you something. He calls all of us to three things three things. I want to give them straight up and then I just want to unpack briefly what they are. God calls us to find holiness in Him, first and foremost. He calls us to find holiness in Him. He calls us to embrace grace with others and then He calls us to live in faithfulness ourselves. I don't know, I don't know where you're at in your journey. He's calling you to these things. These are the things that speak to how we were created, what we were created for, what we're intended for, what we're called to. 
And I want to unpack them just for a moment so that you and I can understand individually and as a church how it, how it impacts us, what it means for how we live today. See, in the book of Leviticus, God actually declares an expectation for all of us. An expectation. And the deal is, he is creator, God. He, he made us. We're made by him and for him. Therefore, he has the right to speak into who we are, what we do, and things like that. And, and in the book of Leviticus, he says this. He says, I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. This is his expectation for us. We're created by him and we are created for him. He is holy. He wants to hang out with us. I get that. I have two boys. I love hanging out with my boys. But what he's saying here, how his desire to be with us is so much bigger because we are created by him. He has intention for us and he calls us to purpose. It's him, it's others and a greater purpose for us. He wants to be with us, but he also calls us to be like him to reflect him, to be image bearers. But sometimes the image gets marred. The image was marred in the woman, but the image was marred in the men. He calls us to holiness. And in our poor choices, in our sin, it gets marred. It happened for the men. It, it happened for the women as well. I guess that's me. Listen, he gives us... All right. I can't stop moving and keep preaching. That just doesn't work for me. <laughs> he gives us space, and that means that we have space to change. The space to change comes in Jesus, my friends. The way that we experience fullness in life is when we receive Jesus. It's by his power at work within us. We find holiness through Jesus. Our sin can be forgiven. We can experience fullness we can find holiness in him. But it's not just holiness in him. We're actually called to embrace grace for others. A, a grace and space for others. It gives us an opportunity and others an opportunity to change, to find our purpose. And grace, my friends, grace is unmerited favor. That's all it is. Unmerited favor means we can't earn it. We can't, we, we can receive it. We can't, we can't find something to make us more qualified. We're not qualified. It's unmerited favor. We can't earn it, but we can receive it as a gift from Jesus. And it's a space where what is actually can be something different. It's the space of more. Uh, Paul, the missionary, wrote this in Romans 8. He said, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Whenever we step into relationship with Jesus, we submit to his authority as Lord, there's no more condemnation. No matter what has been done, there is freedom, there is fullness that comes. There is a space where there isn't condemnation for us or for others. That's the grace space that comes from Jesus. And if you have that in Jesus, super. If you don't, step into it. Receive him as Lord. Let him step in and cover what's been. And let him step in and give you fullness and purpose towards what can be. But if you've received it, if you have it, then you can offer it. If you've received forgiveness, if you've received grace, you can give it. You, you have power in his name to forgive. Not, not just, not forget. We don't forgive and forget. That's not how that works. And we don't forgive and everything's fixed, but we forgive and then there's space for freedom and there's space for healing. And it's the beginning of living into fullness. The author and theologian C.S. Lewis says something pretty pointed. He says, to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus, means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Boom, mic drop. Totally the truth. Our ability to forgive is is rooted in the fact that we've been forgiven. In fact, there's two ways to look at what he said. One is to look at the obligation, and it's a fair obligation, that if we've been forgiven, we should forgive. Uh, to actually be someone who has received forgiveness, but then withhold forgiveness is kind of stinky. It's kind of messed up. And so there's that obligation component that if we've been forgiven, we can forgive dynamic. But there's a second way, and I think it's a subtle nuance, but it's a nuance, and it's to recognize that we actually can forgive because we've been forgiven. It's his power at work within us that allows us to live into forgiveness. In Ephesians 4, verse 32, it's not in your note, God, it's just up here. It says, instead, be kind to, want to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. We're to forgive because we've been forgiven. Jesus says, if we don't forgive, we won't be forgiven. And, and the reality is, no matter what you have experienced... Because we receive forgiveness from Jesus, we can offer forgiveness to other people. It doesn't fix everything, but it creates the platform for flourishing. It creates the platform for change, an opportunity for more. 
there's a form and a function to it. There, there's a manner to forgiveness and there's a might to forgiveness. There's the practice of forgiveness and the power of forgiveness. The power comes from him, not us. That's why we can do it. That's why we can lean into it. And it's not simply a self-discipline. <laughs> it's really more self-control that comes from Holy Spirit. Self-discipline is about willpower, like whether you're gonna eat the chips or not. <laughs> That's willpower. Self-control comes from the Holy Spirit. And we can have the power of the Holy Spirit in us that gives us the ability and the self-control to navigate the complexities we sit in. There's, there's a difference between self-discipline and self-control. On the outside, they look the same. But on the inside, they're radically different because the sources are different. No one understands the difference. That's a bit of a rabbit trail. Let me get back to what we're talking about here. If you're up for it, here's what I encourage you to do about this issue of forgiveness in the space of forgiveness. Spend some time this week reflecting on the reality that in every sin, sadness, or wound, the Lord weeps first. Let me say that again. In every sin, in every sadness, in every wound, the Lord weeps first. See, sin is first and foremost against him. So he grieves first and he mourns first, but he also reaches out in grace and love first. That's powerful. And when you begin to understand that sin is first and foremost against him, it positions you and I to be able to steward the power of forgiveness differently when we realize that in every sin and in sadness and wound that he weeps first. But he also reaches in grace and love first. That woman in the story we read, she did not earn her grace. She couldn't. We can't earn our grace. We can receive it. It's a gift. And we can create spaces of grace for others to connect people to God, to each other, and to their purpose. It's why we go into schools. It's why we're in prisons. It's why we go into neighborhoods and businesses with very intentional, loving posture, not picking up stones. Instead of picking up stones, we invite relationship. It's beautiful, but it's messy. It's a place of joy, but it's also a place of complexity. But not any different than the dynamic between Jesus and the men and the woman that day. And when we're willing to put down our stones, people find their purpose. They have space to find new purpose. We don't always know what's happening, but we intentionally choose to demonstrate our love for God and our love for others in the ways that we invest, constantly and consistently. So God calls us to holiness in him, to embrace grace with others, but also to live in faithfulness ourselves. So there's this third dynamic where how we live matters. And to be faithful in the way we live is important. How we live with others and how we live with God, it's important. Being faithful in our conduct, our choices, our words, sinning no more. A love for God is demonstrated in obedience to God. I was talking to a friend just this week and about the difference between rules and response in a relationship with God. And we fully understand the love of God. It isn't about rules, but there is a natural response that comes out of it. It changes the way we live. We, we live differently, not to earn that love, but we live out of that love differently. And we position others to experience it. It's why Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. He's the same guy who in Ephesians 2 said, for we are God's masterpieces, <laughs> craftsmanship. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he has planned for us long ago. You, my friend, are created, intended, and called for great purpose. Fullness. In the power, in the name of Jesus, you can live into that. That's the real you. And I want to just put a question before you to process today and the rest of this week, and that's just what's your next? What's your next right thing that leads to the next right thing? And not the thing you want it to be or prefer it to be. Well, what's the thing that he has for you as your next? Maybe it is to actually drop a rock that you've picked up. You never should have picked up. You just need to drop it and walk away. Maybe you, you need to read the dirt note, whatever the thing he's trying to write out before you draw into your, into your eyesight. What, what do you need to walk away from? Something that's unholy? Something that maybe has been marked by unforgiveness or resisting God's good work in you? Whatever it is, do it. Your, doing the right thing leads, always leads to your next thing. 
So what is that next thing for you? Just take the time to know that it's the right next thing and lean into it. There, there was a next thing for the men and the women, the men and the woman in this story. But there's also a next for us because here's a crazy thing. In this moment when Jesus was talking with a next for both the woman and the men, there was a next for us because he knew we would be reading this today. <laughs> What's your next? What do you need to leave? What do you need to drop? What do you need to step into that's right and good? What do you need to step away from that's just been filling so that you can be full? The real you, created, intended, and called. To no longer do, to go and no longer do. What, what, do you, what is your next? It could be to leave judgment, to forgive somebody else. Really, in this whole thing, we're, we're talking about this holiness that we find in him. Have, a, have the intimacy with him and, and context of presence with him to, to experience holiness. To have a space of grace for other people, even if they've done stupid, wrong things, to create space of grace. Or, or maybe it's just simply to be faithful, to choose better, to stop choosing poorly. What's your next? You got one. And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I'm telling you, that is your next without starting with a relationship with God through Jesus, the rest of it all falls apart. So that's the place that you maybe you need to start. But if you've done that already, what does the rest of it look like for you to connect deeper with God, more fully with others, but more fully into the purpose he has for you? There's a next. You know, this is a bit of the why behind what we do as a church. And in a few weeks, we're gonna, we're gonna take some time to talk about what we're go going to be doing as a church. In the future, locally, uh, internationally, some of the things God has for us. We've been talking about the why. In a few weeks, we're going to move to the what. And I actually want to take one minute to just show you a quick teaser, uh, a bit of that conversation, because I'm excited about it, but I also want to prime you to be looking forward to that conversation that'll start in a number of weeks. So just check, just check out this video. One of the things I love about the Quad Cities is the unique convergence of people and families, of cultures and communities, and the reality that heritage has been part of that dynamic for more than 50 years, with a very intentional willingness and lean to step into new endeavors to advance God's kingdom, to advance His kingdom in these cities, in our Quad Cities. Since 2014, we've grown from two locations to five locations. We've been privileged to restoratively hold space in two prisons and three schools. We've served and fed and loved thousands of people across our region. And we've had the privilege of playing a part in seeing more than 1,600 people choose to follow Jesus for the first time. And we've baptized more than 1,100. It's wonderful, it's humbling, it's significant. And the space God is calling us to hold is unique. And our work is not done. There's more. I believe the best is yet to come. Oh, it's gonna be good. It's gonna be good. We're gonna, so we've been talking about the why behind our what today. We're gonna move to our what in a couple of weeks. We're gonna uh, actually spend three weeks though in between really dealing with how we live in reality today in a, in a world where there is war and rumor of war where there is conflict and crisis, sadness and sorrow, we're gonna talk about how we navigate that with hope in a series just called Hope in the Dark. So you do not wanna miss the next three weeks, but after that is where we're gonna step more significantly into the next conversation about what we're doing as a church out of the why we've just dug into today. Until that time, continue to lean into understanding what God's asking you for next. You've got a next. Do that right next thing because it leads always to the next right thing and into the fullness that he has for each one of us. So as you process that, I just invite you to pray with me and we're gonna step back into worship through song. Heavenly Father, I thank you just for this time. I thank you for the gift of being your children, being a people together. Um, I thank you for the beauty of community. Uh, I, I thank you for the strength that comes from walking in relationship with you, the power of a risen Lord that feeds into a life that can forgive, a life that can offer grace. I pray, Father, we, we, would live, we would live full lives, not just filled ones, a fullness that comes from your Son, and that we would be finding our holiness in you, we'd extend grace to others, but we would be faithful 
in living into the purpose you called us to. So speak and lead. Help us to step into the right next. And in these next few moments, may you continue to be glorified and honored in all we say and do. We love you. Pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.